Hello, I'm Vanessa. And I'm Haley. And I'm Cole. And welcome to the, the Couch, Couch Potato, Potato Lab. Lab, where we bring science to your own home. Don't forget to download our lab manual at bit.ly backslash Couch Potato Lab, just so you can follow along with us today. Um, while if you get any questions during the show, feel free to text us at 306-570-1013, or you can tweet us using the hashtag Couch Potato Lab on Twitter. While you're on Twitter, feel free to give us a follow at Eyes Youth. We also have accounts on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, all at Eyes Youth, especially on YouTube right here. So today, uh, we are going to be learning some really cool things. I have always wondered about the wind and how, where it comes from. It seems like it co doesn't come from anywhere, it just appears. I have brought two scientists with the utmost credentials here. On my left, who do I have? Hi, my name is Haley. My pronouns are she and her. And my fun fact for today, well, this is a little bit scary, so if you have the same fear as me, then we'll be scared together. But there is a bug somewhere in the studio. It's been flying around my face all day. And if it flies around my face during the show, you might get to see me cry. <gasps> oh no, I hope that doesn't happen. I really hope the bug stays away from you. We'll do our best because my fun fact has to do with that a little bit too. <coughs> my name is Vanessa, my pronouns are she and her, and my fun fact is a little bit of a story. So I was in class one day just in university, hanging out and then there was a fruit fly flying around me and there was people i didn't even know them they were just sitting beside me i felt really cool when i did this but i just picked it i grabbed it out of the air i just snatched it up in my hand and then threw it away so i didn't have to have the like the fly around me anymore so Haley, if the bug comes near you i got you covered who do i have on my right who's my scientist here hello everybody my name is cole my pronouns are he and him and my fun fact is actually a long long time ago because i'm a very very old man a long, long time ago, I was actually hypnotized, and I was hypnotized, I was so deep in hypnosis that I actually started crying my eyes out. And then later on, I sang some stuff. It was pretty wild. But uh, I do recommend hypnosis. It's very, uh, rela a very relaxing experience, I would have to say. Mm. Now, before we begin, I just want to take a moment to recognize that the Couch Potato Lab is coming to you from Treaty 4 territory, which is the traditional territory of the Nahewak, Nakawe, Nakoda, Lakota, and Dakota people, as well as the traditional homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. Thank you, Cole. That's excellent. So we will be getting started on our show. Haley has our first piece of information that we need. So Haley, take it away. Oh, wow. Well, today we're gonna be talking about wind. So I have a little demonstration on the blackboard. All right, I'm just gonna pull it into view here. Do, 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 do. Very good drawing, I love it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I've worked all morning on this. So as you can see, we have the land, we have the sea or the ocean or really, any body of water. And we have these funny arrows. So let me paint a picture for you. You're standing on the beach. It's the middle of the night. And the wind is just blowing at you. It's blowing at you and it's sending your hair flying and you're having a good old time. Well, that is something that we call sea breeze. You might even uh, notice that it smells kind of salty, if salt had a smell. So that is something that we call sea breeze. Now during the day, it's quite the opposite. The wind it would be blowing from behind you. It is going from the land to the ocean. And now that is something that we call land breeze. Now this happens with a bunch of different factors in play, but today we're going to be talking about two of them, which is temperature and air pressure. And so our temperature and air pressure is affecting the way that the wind is blowing. So on our diagram here, during the day, our wind is blowing from the land to the ocean. And that's because it is colder on the land than it is in the ocean. And we are wanting to uh, cool down our ocean. The ocean is too hot. So it's kind of like a fan, if you've ever turned on a fan in a hot room, and it is blowing it away, trying to help our ocean cool down. But at night, it is quite the opposite. So it is going from the sea to the land, because right at that moment, our, um, our sea is colder, so it is trying to blow that way. So yeah, that is the explanation of, s of, l of the wind. Excellent. I always wondered where it came from. That really helps me. So if I, let me know if I have this correct. The wind will go from the colder to the hotter place to cool it down? 
Exactly. It Perfect. will. Yes, because Excellent. we want to be at a regulated temperature and we want it f moving from cold to hot. Cool. Thank you, Haley. That's really awesome. So Cole has our next piece of information to help me get all this piece together. What is it? That's right. So we're going to be spending a lot of time on today's episode talking about air and wind. And part of the, the big concept around air is pressure. Now, Haley mentioned a little bit about pressure and temperature, and all of those things are related to one another. And I'm going to be talking about a really, really special rule in science called Bernoulli's Principle. And principle, I don't mean like the principle of your school. I mean a different kind of principle. This principle sort of means like a law or a rule. Okay. Now Bernoulli's principle states that a fluid that is in motion, and by fluid we could mean a liquid like water, or actually air, the gas around us, is also considered a fluid. Now a fluid that is in motion exerts less pressure than a fluid that is not in motion, so a fluid that isn't moving. Okay. And because of that, Bernoulli's principle say it says that we can have a lot of cool different effects that we can do with air. So I'm going to show you um, a demonstration first here. So this demonstration is um, really interesting. I'm going to I'm going to move my mic first so I don't wreck that. But I'm going to put this piece of paper in front of my mouth, and I'm going to blow directly across, so in a straight line directly across. Now I actually want Vanessa. I want you to make a prediction. Okay. What do you think is going to happen? You can make a prediction at home too. What do you think is going to happen to the paper when I blow directly across, Vanessa? What is your prediction? Um. I would. I don't know what my prediction might be because it's you're not really blowing onto anything except the top of the paper. I don't think it's going to move. I think it's just going to stay. Nothing's going to happen. That's my prediction. Okay, so interesting prediction. Vanessa says that the paper will not move. So we're going to give this a try. Again, I'm just going to blow directly straight across the top of this paper. I'm going to hold it like this, and we're going to hopefully see. Maybe I'll go off to the side so we can really see it. Uh, we're going to see what happens with this paper. Here we go. Three, two, one. Whoa. Whoa. Let's try that one more time. Let's try that one more time. Okay, so hopefully you saw that there at home. Now, what we should have seen is that the paper actually moved up. Okay, so I was blowing straight across and that paper moved up. Now, the reason that this happens is again because of that thing that we call Bernoulli's principle. Now, the air that I was blowing across the top of the paper was moving a lot faster than the air underneath the paper. And we said, according to Bernoulli's principle, that that fast moving air is not going to exert as much pressure as the air underneath. And pressure you can think of as sort of just a force pushing on things. So because there's a lot more pressure underneath the paper when I blow across, that air exerts that pressure and pushes the paper up. And it causes it to almost float for a couple seconds. Now, we're going to be looking at a couple more d demos later that have to do with Bernoulli's principle. But what I want you to keep in mind is what's something that we use as a method of travel that some of us, we, we might see every day in our everyday lives that needs to use Bernoulli's principle in order to, to operate. Think about that for a second and we'll come back to some more Bernoulli's principle demos later on in the show. Thank you, Cole. That was super informative. I think my prediction was a little bit off, but that's okay in science. It's totally fine to be warm, or sorry, it's totally fine to be wrong. My l word slip up was because <laughs> Haley has got a very interesting activity for us maybe having to do with something warm. We'll mm -hmm. see. Haley, take it away. All right, so as I said on the board earlier, uh, we are going to be demonstrating that sea breeze and land breeze. So right now I have some water here and some water here. So what we are going to do is cool down this water. I brought some ice here and we're gonna cool it down. We want it to be super duper cold water. And now this is the main activity. This <gasps> is the main activity <laughs> for today. <laughs> so if you want to follow along, that would be super duper awesome. So we have our water getting super cold here. Now I have a kettle and this kettle has super hot water. You might even be able to see the steam coming off of it. So I'm going to pour it into here. Wow, you can really see the steam. That so is cool. some hot water for sure. Yes, so steam. But what we're wanting to experience here basically is wind. Wind moving from our cold to our hot. I'm just going to set that down there. So you might not be able to see it because we don't normally see wind, but the wind or the air in this room is moving from our cold all the way to our hot. And in order to demonstrate this, I have this candle right here. And I'm going to give it a blowout. And when I do, it is going to create some, s some smoke. 
That's the word I'm looking for, some smoke. And smoke is going to travel from our cold container to our hot, and it will hopefully travel between this, um, this paper towel tube here. So I'm going to give it a blow. Ooh, Excellent. and we have lots of steam. Or not steam, smoke. And we're going to see if we can have it float through and go in this direction. Hmm. I think I see a little yeah, bit coming out of that tube, I, I gotta too. say. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So we see the wind moving from one direction to the other. And this is a direct representation of that sea and land breeze, where it's going from the ocean to the land, or the land to the ocean. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Haley. That is excellent. So if you have any questions that have come up during the show, please tweet us uh, using the ca hashtag Couch Potato Lab on Twitter, or you can text us numbers right there at 306-570-1013. We would love to hear from you. You can even show us anything that you've created. You can show us your smoke moving from one side to the other. That would be excellent. Okay, our next activity, our next demo is very interesting. Might make you a little bit hungry. What is it, Haley? Oh my goodness. Well, I brought marshmallows to the studio today. And I love marshmallows. Amazing. So as you can see on my table here, I have a marshmallow and then I have um, a syringe or a plunger. You might have seen these two uh, administer medicine before, but we're not going to be using it for medicine purposes today. We're going to use it with our marshmallow. So what we are going to do is we are going to take our holder here and I'm going to keep it right on the table and we are going to put our marshmallow inside of there. And you might be thinking, what? That's kind of weird. We don't normally put marshmallows in here, <laughs> but we are going to today. I'm just going to try and get it to the bottom if I can. And what is going to happen is our marshmallow, as you see it in here, it looks like a normal marshmallow. It looks all fluffy and bright and all that stuff. But what we are going to do is we are going to basically take down the pressure. Cole, would you like to explain a little bit about this? For sure, yeah. So <laughs> Haley has the marshmallow inside the syringe. And what's going to happen is we're talking about pressure, we're talking about air, and all of these different relationships between pressure and temperature and volume. Now, volume is how much space is inside something. You can think of it that way. Now, what's going to happen when Haley um, plunges that plunger in the syringe is as she plunges the plunger and she has one end covered with her thumb, she's going to be decreasing the volume, making the volume a lot smaller. And as the volume gets a lot smaller, it increases the pressure. So it's what we call an inverse relationship. So as volume decreases, pressure increases. And if we go back to Haley, we're going to see the actual effects of that happening on the marshmallow. Exactly. So that effect will be a crinkly marshmallow, but don't take my word for it. Let's see. Hmm, if I can get this plunger in here, and I'm going to push down as hard as I possibly can. And that's reducing the volume in here and increasing the pressure. You can see the marshmallow actually shrinking. It is that's shrinking. Crazy. Oh. If we get a really close up, we can see that it's all wrinkly. That is so cool. Not as fluffy and delicious as it looked before. Mm -hmm. And if I take the plunger away, we will see that it will stop being so wrinkly and it will gain back its fluffiness and it returns to be a normal marshmallow. Wow. Wow. That exactly. is excellent. Thank you, Haley, for that amazing demonstration. Our next demonstration is coming from Cole. I think we're going back to Bernoulli Bernoulli's principle that Cole had explained to us earlier. So this is that other demo or another one of the demos that Cole mentioned earlier. Cole? That's right. We are going back to Bernoulli. They don't call me the Bernoulli boy for nothing. <laughs> it's because I am a big Bernoulli head. I'm a big fan of, of Mr. Bernoulli. I believe his first name was Daniel, I think. Shout out to Daniel Bernoulli. Now, we talked about Bernoulli's principle being that fluids, as they're moving, they exert a less a uh, lot less pressure than a stationary fluid. And we showed the paper rising. And hopefully at home you were thinking of, what is the thing, that method of transportation that uses this concept? Hopefully you thought of flying. So this is part of the reasons that planes can fly. As they are moving through the sky, the air moving over top of the wing is moving a lot faster than the air underneath. And this creates a, a force called lift. So there's pressure underneath the wings that keeps the plane up in the sky. And I believe this week we actually had a, uh, an episode about flying. So you probably know a lot about flying already. But let's get to another Bernoulli demonstration. Now I'm going to make, um, Haley and Vanessa, I'm going to make you a, a bet, okay? Okay. Now I don't know, I, I'm going to make you a little bit of a challenge here. I, do you think I can get, inside this cup here I have a ping pong ball. Do you think I can get this ping pong ball from this cup right here 
into this cup without using my hands. Mm. Uh, no way. What else would you use? Your feet? <laughs> uh, I won't even touch it. I won't even touch oh. it. That's, that's the challenge. You think I can do it? I have a question first. Okay. How experienced are you with ping pong? Like how much, how much have you played ping pong in your life? They call me the Forrest Gump of ping pong, hmm. which is a, a compliment. That means I'm very good at ping pong. Interesting. So I think my prediction will be that Cole will be able to get the ping pong ball in, but I have no idea how. You'll have to show us. Well, I am going to use the magic, nay, the science of Bernoulli, our friend Bernoulli, to get this um, ping pong ball into this cup. I'm going to come off to the side. So what I'm going to do is inside here, I have the ping pong ball. Whoa, <gasps> I did have the ping pong ball. The ping pong ball is back inside. There's no tricks. There's no sleight of hand going on here. I'm going to try, and it might take me a couple tries, but I'm going to try to get this ping pong ball into the other cup without touching it. I'm going to hold the cup just for safety reasons. But here we go. Move my microphone. Here we go. Oh, no. Oh, no. I moved the cup. <laughs> OK. Do you want me Everybody to hold the cup? Everybody knows. I think, I, I think I'm going to prop it up against my oh, computer. Everybody knows that you always get three tries at any trick. Mm -hmm. Always get three tries. Let's try, uh, try number two here. Oh, close. That okay, close. I got the cup, or I got the ball out of the cup, which was, that's a huge, that's a huge uh, advancement. Now, the last step then is to get this into the cup. Okay. You this is my it. last try. I'm only trying this one more time. You got it. <gasps> yes, <gasps> folks, we did it. We did it. We have transferred that. That happened live before your eyes. And no, it was not magic. It was the science of Bernoulli's principle. Again, as I blew air across the top of the cup, we know that moving air creates a lot less pressure than stationary air. So the air underneath the ball that wasn't moving forced it up, pushed it up out of the cup and into the other cup. So we can do a fun little magic trick for our friends with Bernoulli's principle. Perfect. Thank you, Cole. If you do try it with your friends, feel free to send us pictures or even a video or ask any questions that come to mind. Um, text us. Our number is 306-570-1013. You can also tweet at us at EyesYouth using the hashtag CouchPotatoLab. While you're on Twitter, please throw us a follow. You can also follow us at EyesYouth on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and on YouTube. Feel free to subscribe. So yes, thank you, Cole. That was awesome. I have a question for the two of you, though. I have just a dream. I have a dream about ping pong balls now that we've been on the topic. Uh -huh. I wish that they could float. I just wish that they could and then it'd be so much easier for me. If I'm playing ping pong, I can just hit the ball or even just imagine it and then the ball will go and I'll always wing ping pong. So the first step in that is to get them to float. Haley, can you try? Do you know how? To get it to float. A Do you have a ping pong ball? ball? I can pass you one if you want, yes, if you would like excellent. to try. I will I, I'll here we take go. Yours. This is Oh, wow. Beautiful connection there. Good catch. Yes. Sign us up. <laughs> I know. Sign us up for the NFL. We mm -hmm. are on our way. Mm -hmm. um, so levitate it? Yeah, if you, if you can. It's just a dream of mine. So like, just throw it up in the air, right? Well, we'll see. Okay. <gasps> oh, hmm. well, maybe if I try, like Cole got three tries. Yeah, yeah you okay, can, I'll Cole give you three, three tries. That's That's okay. That works. Yeah. That's fine. Well, maybe if I just throw it a little higher. We want it to levitate. We want it to stay up there. Use your mind. Use my mind. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think you're right. You got really it. Really focus. Really focus. So this time, instead of trying to throw it, I will use my mind. I've never seen her focus this hard on this anything. Is, it's got to work. I Come hope on. she doesn't explode. <laughs> Come on. I don't think it's working. Oh. Haley, I'm sorry. I get one more try. You get one more okay, try, one more. I guess. Give it your best shot. Well, hmm. So I've tried to throw it. I've tried to make it go with my mind. Mm -hmm. What about those basketball players that can spin it on the tip of their oh. finger? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, that is the logical next step after, after telekinesis is to try to do basketball. <laughs> well, yeah. I think anything better than just levitating is levitating and spinning, mm. kind of like our Earth. Maybe it'll yeah, spin okay, so fast that it will just levitate like how the sun and Earth do. Yeah, in so space. Let's, let's give it a try. Okay. Oh. Oh. oh, you know, Haley, it's okay. Thank you so much. You helped me get a start on completing my dream. Cole, do you have anything else? You can also have three tries if you would like, but I just really, I really want my dream to come true. Cole, well, do you have anything? Vanessa, I'm glad that you asked because I actually brought something from home. This is 
uh, a little item that I use every morning before the Couch Potato Lab to make sure I'm looking my best. And I think I might be able to use this hair dryer here to levitate a ping pong ball. So let's try mm. that pass again. Let's see if we can oh. make another connection NFL style. It. Okay. Here we go. <gasps> oh, oh, a no. little short. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. I think okay. I've more got of it. a receiver than I've a got it. You can do that. So I have secured the ping pong ball again. And we, Vanessa has challenged us to levitate the ping pong ball. Now, the reason I think that Haley couldn't do it is because she's not, she's just not as big of a fan of Bernoulli as I am. Oh. I am the Ber Bernoulli boy after all. So I'm going to use a little bit of Bernoulli's principle to levitate this ping pong ball. So this is an ordinary hair, hair dryer, as you can see. It's doing wonders on my head. And what's going to happen is I am going to turn this hair dryer on and I am going to try to levitate the ping pong ball on top of the hair dryer. Okay. Okay. That's a good. Here try. we go. So I'm going to turn this on. It's running. We've got air coming out of that. Now, sometimes this does take a few tries, but I'm going to try my best. You got to place it really carefully. <gasps> and there we go, folks. Oh. Okay, let's see if I can get it again. We had it going for a little bit. It's a little it's I'm I got high power mode on, I think. <laughs> Too intense. Oh. There we go. That's perfect. We are levitating. The ping pong ball. Bring that it back. Oh, okay. You know what, Cole? That's perfect for me. We did My it. dream has been accomplished. It can happen. Thank you so much. I'm just, I'm so pleased that my dream will come true now. So we have a quick question from a viewer. The question is, does Bernoulli's principle involve, is Bernoulli's principle involved with hot air balloons as well? Do they have anything to do with that? Cole, I know you're the expert on Bernoulli. That's right. Do you, have you got this question covered? I, I can definitely um, cover this question. Now, I actually was lucky enough to go on my very, very first hot air balloon ride last summer. It was a, a, an amazing experience. I highly recommend it. Had to get up really, really early in the morning. And it's actually crazy how fast those hot air balloons lift off. We went to a big open field and we climbed inside and they started heating up. You'll, if you've ever seen a hot air balloon or if you've seen them on TV or something, you'll know that um, it's essentially this giant balloon, exactly how it sounds. And at the center, there is um, some fuel and a burner. And that burner burns that fuel and creates a big flame. And the purpose of that flame is to give off heat. So we were all huddled up inside that um, basket that uh, you go up in in the hot air balloon. And the hot air balloon pilot turns on the gas and he turns on the burner and it gets really, really hot. And the balloon starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger and start to um, heat up. What's happening is that flame, that burner, is heating up the air, all right? And as air gets um, hotter and hotter, it expands. And as it expands, it's putting that same kind of um, lift pressure that we were talking about before with a plane on the insides of the balloon. And that air keeps expanding, expanding, fills up the balloon, and eventually you get enough force to be able to actually lift off the ground. So while we were flying in that hot air balloon, um, there was some times where we could just be floating, but every so often uh, the air would start to cool down. So as the air cooled down, the pilot would have to turn the burner back on to heat up the air a little bit more so that we could stay at the same level the entire way. So a hot air balloon works by heating up that air inside of the balloon, which causes the air molecules to expand and push against the sides of the balloons, giving that lift force that we can use to actually fly the hot air balloon. So that's how a hot air balloon works. Cool. That's awesome. So it, it really is just as it sounds, hot air. Mm -hmm. That is excellent. Thank you, Cole. We have a very delicious demo coming up. It will make you hungry once again. Our apologies. But Haley, take it away. Oh my goodness. Well, we do have that demo coming up. But before we can get into the deliciousness of it, we need to understand the science. Mm -hmm. And that science will be done on our whiteboard. Or, uh, my apologies, our... Is it okay? It is okay. We are going to make it through. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to just flip this around so we can get a fresh side. Do you need a helper nice to hold flip. it, maybe? Nice flip. Good flip. You know, I think, I think I'm good. Okay, perfect. But thank you for offering. No worries. <laughs> we might just be writing a little sideways, and that is a-okay. That's okay. So we have three types of ways that heat can be moved or transferred around us. And we experience them every day, and you just don't know it. So we're going to start off with our first one, and I'm going to write it on the board. So this first one is called conduction. 
conduction. Conduction is when we have heat coming directly from a surface. It is coming off of the beach is the best example I can think of. So I want us to go back to that beach. It can be night, it can be daytime, it can be any time of year. And you're standing on that beach and it is so hot on your feet. It is just burning your feet. And that's because that heat is coming um, from, that gr from the ground and it is heating your feet up because you have direct contact with the sand. Same as if you're standing on concrete, it might be super duper hot. Or when we're walking our dogs, you might need to be careful about walking your dog on concrete because that concrete can get really hot. And that is conduction heat transfer. So that is our very first type of heat transfer. And our second one is called convection. And I'm going to write it on the board as our third one. Those words sound very similar. Conduction, convection. They Interesting. do. And you might have heard of a convection oven, actually. Yeah. Exactly, because they are different. So we have our conduction, but convection is when the heat is moving around in the air. So I have another, another place to take you here with an image. So you are somewhere outside, maybe in the middle of a field, and it's windy, but instead of being cooled down by the wind, you're getting heated up because mm. it's just transferring all that heat through the wind. Or we have that in an air fryer, if you have an air fryer at home because uh, the air is traveling around and it is heating up our food and transferring heat through the air. So those are two examples of convection. And our last one, I'm going to write it on the board, but before I do, do I have any guesses? So we have conduction, convection, what's our last one? Does it start with a C? Does it start with a B? Who, who knows? Hmm, I don't know. I feel like it's too many C words already. It must start with something else. So I'm gonna rule out the C. Cole, what do you think? I do actually have a guess. Oh. My guess, and this is just something that's at the top of my mind, I believe the third one is called radiation? <gasps> You're radiation? right, Cole. You're very right. We have radiation. Good guess, Cole. Thank you. Must be a scientist. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so our radiation is our last form that heat can be transferred or moved around around us. So radiation can come in a couple different forms. I want you to imagine putting something into a microwave. You want to heat up that hot dog for dinner and you want to put that wiener right in the microwave. Um, so that would be radiation because the heat is going through um, the microwave and it is radiation. Um, we also have from the sun. Have you ever gotten a sunburn? And it hurts so much. And that is because the radiation from the sun, it's, it's um, putting heat onto us through radiation. Or the last example, is if we think about, if you know anybody that has had cancer before, they might be treated with a treatment called radiation. And that is quite different. We're not just heating them up like a baked potato. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a little different, but it's still the same principle. Oh, Haley, I actually think I just thought of another form of radiation that people might know about. Um, is, I believe, x-ray. If you've ever gone to get an x-ray, maybe you um, broke your arm or you uh, broke your foot or something like that, you, you have a fracture. Uh, an x-ray is also another form of radiation that uh, we use. And again, obviously, n it's not used to heat us up or anything like that. But those different forms of radiation have different wavelengths as they travel through the air. And they can hit different parts of our body and allow us to see things that we, not, uh, we wouldn't normally be able to see. So lots of different types of radiations. That's really awesome. We even talked about radiation in yesterday's episode about space because when astronauts go into space, they are not protected as much from the sun. So our ozone layer around the Earth, it's the Earth's atmosphere, it protects us from the radiation to a point. So astronauts, when they're in space, they need to wear a spacesuit or humans on Earth, the radiation might hurt your skin, so you wear sunscreen. Pretty cool. Haley? Anything else? I do. So we know about our three forms of heat transfer here, and we are going to use it today. Because did you know that you can make popcorn all three of these ways? You can make popcorn uh, with conduction heat transfer, convection heat transfer, and radiation heat transfer. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So That's so mm -hmm. cool. Exactly. So we are going to make popcorn two of those ways, and you will be in charge of making popcorn the third way at home. Mm. Wow, yummy. Lucky them. <laughs> lucky viewers, I gotta well, say. Lucky viewers is right. So I have my popping machine here. And what happens with this machine is that it gets really hot on the bottom. We put this lid on top, obviously, so the popcorn doesn't go everywhere. And it gets really, really hot on the bottom. And that heat kind of transfers into the popcorn kernels directly. 
So when we're talking about that direct contact, we're thinking of conduction. Excellent. So I'm going to go ahead and pour my popping corns into here. And we're going to plug it in. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Ooh, it's and moving. We're, and we're going. So we will see when this starts to pop. It is when there is enough heat that is transferred from the bottom into the popping corns that it starts to pop. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is so cool. While we wait for uh, the popcorn to be popping and Haley interrupt us whenever it starts to pop, but we actually have a very, very good question. So the question is, what's the difference between wind and breeze? This is a question I have always, always wondered. Either my scientist, do we have a taker? Who knows this best? Yeah. Uh, Haley, uh, you got it? I think you got it. I think I do yeah. have it. So I'm just referring to HQ here, just to make sure that I get this right. I don't want to get this answer wrong because it's so important. Um, and so basically, the difference between wind and breeze. So wind, um, we perceive it as to be just stronger, right? Wind might blow you over, whereas a breeze is just that soft, standing on the beach, letting the salt kind of wash over you, that soft one that you can tolerate more. But that wind is what we have in Saskatchewan most of the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do we ever. Do, Do we, we ever. ever. Mm -hmm. So true. I really feel that sometimes when I'm riding my bike, it's very difficult to ride right into the wind. We have one other question. So the question is, how does wind direction work? Cole, have you got this one covered? Do I ever? That's what we were just saying, Vanessa. And <laughs> I, do I ever have this question? Now, the f interesting thing about wind, and this seems to go with a lot of different things that happen in our Earth, uh, or on our Earth, I should say, is that it's kind of complicated. There's lots of different factors. There's usually not just one reason for a lot of things. There's a whole bunch of different factors that work together. So how does wind direction work? Well, what you'll notice is in most places um, around the Earth, the wind usually goes in the same direction every single time it blows. Now, that doesn't mean that it's always just going in a straight line. When you get gusts of wind that swirl, or, they, or there's little smaller effects where the wind changes directions, but in general, the wind always goes in the same direction. And one of the reasons is something called the Coriolis effect, which I think we might be talking about later. So I don't want to spoil it too much, but maybe we'll get to that in a second. The Coriolis effect has to do with the fact that the Earth is spinning right now. Even though we don't feel it, we're spinning really, 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 really fast. But because we're attached to the Earth, kind of, and gravity's pulling us down, luckily we don't feel that speed. Because if we did feel that speed, I think we might be getting a little bit sick. So the Earth is spinning. That's one reason that the wind goes in certain directions. Another reason is because there is different um, friction levels. Now, the air is moving um, on top of the Earth's surface, and it's going to be touching the Earth's surface at different points and causing different levels of friction. And that friction is going to cause the wind to travel in different directions. And if we don't re remember, friction, remember, is the force of two surfaces rubbing up against each other. So if you rub your hands like this really, really fast, you'll notice that they get kind of hot. And that's because friction in between your two hands is causing some heat to be released. So friction in between the air and the Earth's surface, um, the Coriolis effect of the Earth spinning around, those are just two of the many reasons that the wind has different directions depending on where you are on the Earth. Wow, thank you so much, Cole. That is great. So we will be getting in to our next um, method of cooking popcorn. I think Cole has this one covered. Haley, do you just want to remind us what it's called? I will. So we've done conduction. And now we are about to do convection. That's right, convection. Now, I'm, I've brought back my hand dandy hair dryer that I use to make myself look so good for the couch potato lab. And what I've done is I've taken the same popping kernels that Haley put in, ho in her uh, conduction machine over there. And I'm going to use a little bit of convection um, to cook these. Not only am I a Bernoulli boy, but I'm also a, a convection kook. <laughs> that means I love convection. <laughs> and inside here, I've got my popping kernels. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to blast it with some hot air. I don't know <laughs> if this is necessarily going to, um, we're, we're going to have enough time to actually cook something. But the pr same principle applies. We're using hot uh, gas to try to cook the popcorn. So we're going to turn this on. It might be a little loud. Turn it on full. And I'm just going to start to 
really cook these up, okay? So I'm cooking them up. I'm getting some, some blowback on my <laughs> head, but that's okay. So ideally, and I can, feel, I can feel the cup getting hotter, so we definitely are creating some temperature change in there with our um, hair dryer. So ideally, if I do this for long enough, we are going to cause enough heat energy to be transferred from the hot gas coming out of the hair dryer to the popping kernels. And then maybe we'll have some <laughs> delicious movie theater style popcorn uh, eventually. I don't think we brought any butter though. That was maybe our first mistake. A little Aww. bit of butter would be nice. Next um, time. Haley, how is your conduction popping going on over there? It is slowly working. So we have a couple of pop kernels here. I suspect that there might have been a cover that was supposed to be on here. I will admit that this popcorn machine was when, from when I was about eight years old, and so it might not be up to code in the popping world today. But we do have a couple pops in here. I can try and tilt the... Let's see those pops. Yeah, I can try and tilt... Oh, the I think we do, we do see them, actually. Look at wow, that. Wow, look at those. So this is truly working. The conduction is happening. Mm-hmm. Wow. Exactly. Fantastic. That is perfect. Viewers at home, you are in charge of the final method. So you need to make sure, don't need to, but if you want a snack, then you can use your microwave to, of course, with parents' help, to pop some popcorn, and that'll be the radiation form. It sends waves through, and then the popcorn will get popped, and then you can have a treat, because who wants to eat a popcorn kernel? Not me. Not me either. No. We have just a quick, I think, two questions just to throw in here really mm -hmm. quick. So our first one. My mom says I should go outside because it's healthy and I need to get vitamin D. But then she says not to stay out for too long because the sun can hurt me. Why is that? Well, that's a very, very good question. Now, we talked about before that the type of heat transfer that we want you, if you can, to try at home with your popcorn is using a microwave, and that emits that thing called radiation that we were talking about before. So the radiation that a microwave oven uh, emits is actually called microwaves, all right? And that name sort of describes what they're like. Micro, really, really small, waves, all right? Now, um, all the light that we can see, the reason that you can um, see the, the television right now is because there is a different form of radiation called visible light that's hitting the cells in your eyes and allowing you to see. So there's all of these different types of radiation. Now, the sun, what a, a very, very important, we had a space episode this week and you probably learned about how important the sun is to life uh, on Earth. The sun emits a lot of radiation that uh, hits the Earth. Now it emits visible light, which is part of the reason when the sun comes up, we can see all of the wonders of the world. But also it emits something called ultraviolet or UV radiation as well. Now UV or ultraviolet radiation is a different wavelength. It's a different part of the spectrum of radiation. And the reason that when we have to go outside, our parents might say to put on some sunscreen is because UV radiation can be damaging to our body. When UV, ra UV radiation, if enough of it comes in and hits our cells, it can sort of change the DNA that's inside of our cells. And sometimes when the DNA is changed inside of our cells, Remember, the DNA is like the instructions for our cells to know what to do, what to make, what to um, do what in, their, in their daily lives. And if that instruction manual is changed, the cells in our body, maybe in our skin, that's often wh where this happens when we're getting UV radiation, that instruction manual changes. And if the instruction manual changes, our cells are going to maybe do something that we don't necessarily want them to do. And that can lead to some serious problems later on in life. So when we put sunscreen on, that helps to reflect a lot of those UV rays away from our skin, away from our body. So that way they don't actually get inside of our cells and start to damage our DNA. So it's very, very important especially as now it's been really, really hot recently um, where we're filming the Couch Potato Lab and it's getting hotter and the sun is out for longer. It's really important when we go outside to make sure we're putting lots and lots of sunscreen on um, in order to block from those harmful ultraviolet radiation rays that are coming from the sun. Thank you, Cole. Another really important thing, because we want to protect ourselves along with the sunscreen and talking about the vitamin D, is that especially during the winter, because at least here in Saskatchewan and many other parts of Canada, we're really high up north. So the sun is not at a great angle for about six months of the year during the winter time. So and especially then we're not going outside much. And even if we are, our skin isn't exposed because we're wearing a jacket. So we need to make sure during especially during the winter months and all around the year to be getting vitamin D from our diet. It's really important. Okay, 
we have a really, really great game to play. Ooh. It is going to be time for our potato problem. Woo! Okay, excellent. I'm I am so excited too. Potato Me problem. Too. Okay, Cole, you get to have your yes. situation first. Gotta you grab my whiteboard here. Okay, perfect. I'm ready. Just need your whiteboard and your brain. And I know you've got that one on I you. I do have my brain today. <laughs> so, Cole's situation. Are you ready? I am ready. In an earlier episode, you mentioned that you kayak to work. Is that still correct? It is still correct. I do kayak to work. I'm not going to go through the whole routine. I did my first introductory episode. I told you how I kayak to work, and I told you the whole route. Um, and let's just say it's getting even harder with that sun out there. But I, I am putting the sunscreen on. Perfect. So I do still <laughs> kayak to work. That was a long <laughs> way of saying that. I'm glad you're still kayaking to work because that's key to this question. Mm -hmm. So you're on your kayak to work. Have you found it more difficult when there is wind by chance? You have read my mind. Vanessa, just like that hypnotist, hypnotist did oh. so many years ago. Excellent. So Yes, it is very, very hard. Uh, when in the wind, if I'm going into the wind, it's like something is pushing back at me, and I almost sometimes I feel like I'm going backwards. Wow. Not On good. for your potato problem, do you think you could make your commute to work a little bit easier? Your kayak, could it be stronger? I don't know. You'll have to draw. Draw on your whiteboard. Let us know later. Okay. It's time for Haley's. Interesting. Okay, Haley, are you ready? I am ready. Let's hear it. Okay, Haley, you and your family are hanging out in the living room of your house, okay? Okay. You and your dad want the room to be very hot. <gasps> but we're conflicting here because your brother and your mom want it to be cold. How will you solve this problem? Can you make everyone happy? I don't know. We'll have to see. Go ahead. Get started. You're on the clock. Viewers at home, you also get your own personal potato problem. So we've been talking about popcorn. Let's just say your popcorn machine is broken. What will you use to pop your popcorn? How will you do this? Think about our three methods of popping popcorn and heat transfer. We've got conduction, convection, and radiation. Anything that you feel might work, go for it. Cole, have you gotten to start? What's your thought process here? Okay, um, I, am, I am working on something. It will be revealed soon. Now. I've actually decided to go a different route. I'm not going to modify the kayak itself because I do have a top of the line model and I will avoid my warranty if I make any <laughs> modifications. So instead, I think what will be easier is if I try to change the wind patterns, okay? Oh. I think I have an idea of how I'm going to change the wind patterns. So instead of facing the wind, going into the wind the entire time, I can just have the wind at my back. Very nice. Haley, what's your thought process? So this happens a lot in my house. Somebody wants it hot, somebody wants it cold. And I, I've encountered this so many times. So this has given me an opportunity to really think this through and think of a practical solution to this. Okay, I'm excited to hear about it. Viewers at home, we would love to hear what your potato problem solution is. But first, let's hear from Cole. Cole, are you ready? To present, or do you need a minute? I think I'm ready. Okay. I think I'm ready. I just have one final detail. You know what? I'm going to do it on the fly, I think. I, I think I'm ready to go. Go for it. What have you got? Well, this was a fantastic potato problem. Thank you for this potato problem, Vanessa. Now, like I said, I cannot make any modifications to my kayak. So instead, I am just going to simply, and I'm sure this would be really easy, change the direction of the wind. Now, we talked about that the reason that the wind goes in certain directions is because um, there is... Uh, lots of different factors, but one of them is that the Earth is spinning. So the Earth is spinning, and we're spinning in the same direction. Now, uh, I have my, um, my lovely diagram here. So the w this is me in my kayak, <laughs> and I drew it with my hair that I do really, really well after um, you know, I use my hair dryer in the morning, and I make sure I look really, really pretty. But the wind is normally coming right in my face, okay? which is bad. That means it's really, really hard for me to get up to max speed, which I'm doing you know, 70 clicks. <laughs> on my kayak, I can't get up to max speed if the wind is directly in my face. So what do I do? Well, I know that the Earth is spinning a certain direction, and that is causing the wind to go in a certain direction. So simply play a reverse card, OK? <laughs> play that reverse card, and that reverse card is going to physically switch the spin of the Earth. So the Earth is moving in a certain direction. It's spinning in a certain direction. If I were to somehow, using my reverse card, flip the direction of the spin of the Earth, well, all of those wind patterns are going to change. And instead of a headwind, which is going to cause me to greatly 
decrease my max speed, I'll have a tailwind. And instead of 70 clicks, I might be getting up to 140, all right? Whoa. Which uh, I've never done before, which could be huge. So the plan is, just to recap, the plan is, is if I switch the direction that the Earth is spinning, that's the Earth spinning right there, that's the normal direction, say instead, watch this. This is how easy it is, folks. I take this, bam, and uh, what do I want to do? This way. <laughs> now, the Earth is spinning in a different direction. The Coriolis effect says that, that means that the wind is going to change direction as well. And I'm going to have a heck of a good time kayaking to work from now on. Wow, you're 140 clicks. That's really fast. I actually at can't least, even imagine. At, at least. least. Minimum. Perfect. That was a really great solution to the potato problem. Thank you so much, Cole. Haley, what's your solution? So, Cole's is quite practical. <laughs> We can all just use that reverse Every card. single day, useful. I love it. Yeah, mine's a little obscure. <laughs> so I've created something that I, I've just discovered this. So um, I will be um, buying the rights to this so that nobody takes it. Mm. Um, and bear with me because the name is a little odd. Okay. It's called a fan. <laughs> wow. And so the solution is to make the room very, very hot. So hot that my dad and I are in paradise. We love it. But we want the fan to be pointing at my mom <coughs> and my brother in order to create that wind to cool them down. Wow. That's also a very good solution. Not as practical as Cole's, obviously. No, but, but it's still really, really good. It is still really good. But congratulations to both of you. Viewers at home, we would love to hear what your solution was. F and if you have any questions, our Ask a <coughs> Scientist segment is coming up shortly. So make sure you get your questions in there. Sh show us what you've done for your potato problem solution. We'd love to hear from you. Text us. The number is 306-570-1013. Or you can tweet us at EyesYouth using the hashtag CouchPotatoLab. While you're on Twitter, please follow us uh, also at EyesYouth. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or subscribe on YouTube. We would love to have you. And yes, get those questions in because right after our STEM Spotlight, it will be time for Ask Our Scientists. Let's see our STEM Spotlight. Meet June Bacon Bursey, the very first African-American meteorologist to deliver the weather on television in 1971. A meteorologist is a type of scientist that studies the atmosphere to predict and understand Earth's weather. She co-founded the American Meteorological Society's Board on Women and Minorities. Even though she's not with us today, she remains a trailblazer for African-American women everywhere. Okay. Perfect. So we will be doing our Ask Our Scientist portion now. All right, our first question coming at us from the Hayes Brothers. Thank you, Hayes Brothers, for always viewing and sending us such excellent questions. <laughs> the first, we'll save the really key part of the question, but this is actually a really special occasion. The Hayes Brothers Bomb has a quick question for us. It's actually for Haley, and she wants to know if you did your own hair today. Oh my goodness. If <laughs> I did my own hair today, <laughs> well, unfortunately, our hair and makeup team here at the Couch Potato Lab is <laughs> off for the long weekend. So I did do my hair today. Wow, it looks very cute. Mm -hmm. I really like it. Thank you. The main part of this question, let me just see, is, let's see, perfect. Where is wind made? Haley? Where do you know? is wind made? So basically, wind is the Earth's reaction to being too hot. There's a part of it, maybe it's in Saskatchewan. It is too hot. The sun is beating down on Saskatchewan way too much. It is getting hot, and the Earth says, okay, we need to get some wind over here. We need to move it out. So that's where the wind is coming from. And it can happen in small areas. It can happen in, you know, Cupar, Saskatchewan, or Kamloops in BC. It can happen anywhere. Or it can be in a wider area, such as like all of Saskatchewan, which it always seems to be. <laughs> it, it, it does always seem to be windy here. Our next question is, for underground animals, how do they stay warm if they don't see the light of day? Cole, do you know this one? Yes, I do. Now, we know a lot, and actually in Saskatchewan, we have a lot of animals that burrow themselves underground at different parts of the year and then they maybe they keep their habitats um, down there but here's here's something everybody at home if, you, if you're able to just join me doing some of this okay a little bit of calisthenics a little bit of aerobic exercise okay get the blood pumping and what you'll notice is as we do this as we do this one a we look good okay <laughs> obviously but two 
what I'm trying to demonstrate is after we exercise, after we do something that gets our heart pumping and gets the blood flowing, we feel a little bit warm. I know I'm feeling a little bit hot now. And uh, that's because I'm working out my muscles. I'm getting the heart pumping, I'm getting the blood pumping, and lots of different chemical reactions are going on in my body as that happens, and those chemical reactions release some heat. So the answer is, is one of the answers, is that one way that these animals that spend a lot of time underground and don't see light of day uh, maintain their body temperature is they're always moving, all right? They're burrowing, they're moving around in those little tunnels, uh, and that's creating a lot of heat, which helps to keep them warm. And actually, another note from HQ that I heard, this is pretty interesting, is that um, some reptiles and amphibians, if you're familiar with those, uh, they will actually, during the colder months of the year, increase glucose levels in their blood. Now, glucose is maybe one of the most important molecules to, um, I was going to say to us humans, but to really any living thing, and that is because it's a, it's a really good source of energy. So if they increase the glucose levels in their blood, it actually prevents ice crystals from forming, which can happen in some species of amphib amphibians or reptiles. So um, animals that don't see the light of day that often, there's lots of different options that they have that can keep their core body temperature up. Thank you, Cole. That was a really great example, especially at the beginning. That really documented your nickname of Swole Cole. Yes. So thank you for just reinforcing that one for mm -hmm. us. Our next question is for Haley. Which is hotter, the North Pole or the South Pole? Oh, my goodness. Well, let's get one thing straight. They're both very, very cold. And that's why not that many people live there. But you are right that one is colder than the other. And so to get to this answer, we're going to paint another picture in our mind. And I'm going to ask my scientists and hosts for some, some answers as well. Okay. So I'm going to be climbing Mount Everest. What are some things that I might need equipment-wise to climb M Mount Everest? Mm, boots, hiking boots, so that you can climb efficiently. Boots would be good. I'm also just thinking in general, you should probably dress warm. You should probably put some, like a coat on. You dress know? warm? But yeah. what if it's summertime? Well, I'm, I think it's still pretty cold up on Mount Everest, um, no matter what time of year you're going up there. That is correct. So the higher up that we go, the temperature actually gets a lot colder. So while both the North and the South Pole are very, very cold, the South Pole has more mountains and therefore it is colder. Oh, that's very, very interesting. Thank you, Haley. Our final question for Ask Our Scientist is from Sabrina the Teenage Witch. That is oh a great wow. name. Love that show. All right. Is it true that you can pop popcorn with a cell phone? And then what kind of heat would that be? Cole? That is an interesting question. I think um, this sort of comes from, I think there was some viral videos going around back in the early days of the internet of people popping popcorn seemingly with their cell phone. However, I'm here to officially bust that myth debunked. And that is because to, in order to heat up popcorn kernels and to get them to pop, you actually need around 450 degrees Fahrenheit of heat uh, energy. That's the temperature that you need to get to, which is far hotter than any cell phone could emit. Now our cell phones do emit some forms of electromagnetic radiation, which is things like x-rays and microwaves and visible light and ultraviolet, that spectrum that we were talking about earlier. They do emit some radiation, but it is not nearly enough to actually cook anything, let alone popcorn. So, sorry, Sabrina, you can't cook popcorn with your cell phone, but if you get a microwave, have at her. And it, it, that will work for sure. Perfect. Thank you, Cole. Okay, that's the end of our Ask Our Scientist questions. Those were all great questions. Thank you so much. Now, we get to announce our giveaway winner. This is very, very, very exciting. So the question was, for the giveaway that was happening this past week, was what muscle did Kobe play in the opening skit of episode six called Take a Breath? And here's the answer. I am the lungs, and I will take your breath away. Um, I'm a muscle. Hello, I am the heart, and I'm going to make your heart beat. <laughs> Good job, that was Kobe. The answer was that Kobe was the heart. And we got a very lucky winner. We had five entries. All of you were totally correct, so congratulations. But we could only have one winner, and that is, can I get a drum roll from everybody? The Hayes Brothers! Whoa! Whoa. Congrats. So, since it's the brothers, we can actually only have one of you attending camp, but you could have the other one attending camp if you want to sign up. 
or we're going to be having lots of giveaways throughout the rest of the summer for Couch Potato Lab. So keep tuning in. There might be another free week of camping given away. But yes, one of the Hayes brothers, a free week of camp. Congratulations. I'm so happy for you. Can't wait to see you there. Speaking about camp, we are starting our virtual summer camps coming up soon um, in the first week of July. So the camps are really, really awesome. They're going to be virtual. It's two hours of face-to-face -face time on Zoom, either from 9 to 11 a.m. or 1 to 3 p.m. That's our face-to-face -face time, but you will be getting a box delivered to your house. Um, if you are interested, it's for five days for a five-day week, which are most of the weeks. It will be $65 for a four-day week is $55. Um, you can sign up on our website. We've got three different options. So there is the all girls option, the code makers option, option and the eyes option. So uh, lots of different science, lots of great stuff, ways to build confidence in STEM areas. We can't wait to see you there. Uh, and if that is too expensive for you or you'd like to spend your money elsewhere, you can apply for a bursary. So bursaries are will be available this year. We can't wait to see you all there. Thank you so much. We'll be having lots of episodes next week. Please tune in. We will see you there. Download that those lab manuals from Couch Potato Lab, which will be on BIT dot ly backslash couch potato lab and we will see you next time we'd like to thank our supporters actua and the u of r and yes see you next week thank you for joining us goodbye bye, bye, -bye. see you later